Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm very glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got one of those uh, messages that um, we'll see how God wants to speak it. <laughs> I was, this, this is the second Sunday in a row. I've sat down and I've gone over my, my notes. I, just, I pray and I listen to the Spirit of the Lord and I try to come up with the message that He wants to speak for the hour. One of the most important things I think we can speak is not just a message, but the message that God wants to touch the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, there's a lot going on in our society, in our world, for that matter, uh, in, in different things like that. And how many, the, the news wants to grab your attention. And if you feed yourself on that, what you wind up with is discouraged. What you wind up with is, is of all the things that are going on. And uh, I know, uh, I know we've, we've get preachers that preach, well, this is the end times, the last, the last, the last, the last days, all these different things. And, and, and it's probably correct. But the fact is, is, is that what we're supposed to be focused on with the church? And this is the things I pray all the time. I ask God, I says, where, where's our focus supposed to be? I know where the devil wants our focus to be. He wants to think it's hopeless. He wants to think everything is hopeless. There's not a chance. This is this, what it is, what it is. That's all there is to it. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so on and so forth. We have people in the body of Christ that don't want to serve him anymore. They just want to just go on, on about their own way and say, well, you know, I, I did that. That's, that phase is past in my life. Well, hallelujah, it's not supposed to be past. It's supposed to be uh, uh, growth and going forward. When I sit down and I listen to the Lord, I'm looking for what he wants to say to the church, uh, not just the church here in Key West. Now with live stream, we go out all over the world, uh, uh, different things like that. But the message that I believe the, the, the church and pastors need to be preaching is what God is saying. Not what we're being impacted by our surroundings, but what is God saying? God is always, all through the Bible, he's always said differently than what you see. Okay? Moses is up against the Red Sea. He doesn't know what he's going to do. Here comes Pharaoh's army. They're ready to kill off two million people. And it, they're all armed to the teeth, ready to do it, because they're just angry. And Moses goes to God and says, God, what shall I do? He inquired of the Lord, for the next move because it was the Lord's next move. And he said, what's that in your hand? Isn't it amazing how we're in a, seems to be in impossible circumstances, situations in this day and hour, but God is saying, what's in your hand? What's at your availability? The rod, of course, was in his hand and he was talking about the rod. The rod represented the authority that God had given Moses. When he threw the rod down in front of Pharaoh, it turned into a serpent. When he picked the serpent up by the small end, what was God saying? You take care of the little end, I'll take care of the big end. And when he picked up the rod, it turned back into a rod. God so desires to co-labor through us, it isn't funny. I mean, we just, we, but we got to give him something to work with. And this is what I think about all the time. Am I, I talk about myself, I'm not talking about anybody in the church, but by myself. Am I giving God enough to work with? so he can get the message out. My job seems to be to bring the message forth, to bring the revelation forth. I do other things. Uh, um, uh, I make sure the ministry here is running. Right. We have Lighthouse Christian Academy, all the different things I begin to do. Uh, but I am, I, am I preparing myself and looking at the right things? Anymore, I've got to turn the news off. I'm telling you. And, and, uh, because it seems like there's a big market and there's a, a lot of money being made for your fear Amen. because fear attracts, attracts attention and they want the, and, and it, when it attracts the attention for us, this is what it, what it, it pulls the attention away from what God wants to do and it's, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, like that. But the fact is, anyway, let me get into my message this morning. What I, what I saw, out of all the things that we go through, all the things we I see a great exchange. And that's the title of my message this morning, The Great Exchange. How I many know Jesus did what he did? He said what he has said in the middle of conflict. Jesus never was without conflict. <laughs> his disciples, even uh, after his ascension, were never without conflict. And I want to, uh, uh, but I, I noticed something. How many know it is, if we look at our problems and look at our situation, as soon as our problem uh, becomes uh, bigger than our God, we will live in reaction to the problems. And the devil will have influence in our agenda. Amen. I'm going to say that again. As soon as we look 
as soon as we, uh, our problems become bigger than our God. In other words, our problems are so bad we cannot see the answer. We cannot see God past the problems. Uh, oh, and and, and then, it, then it fluctuates over into our service, our service to God, our sacrifice to the Lord. I want to say, what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice is a step above convenience. Okay, so it affects that. And basically when it affects that, it takes our worship and our service and begins to diminish it to nothing more than a religion. And when it boils it down to nothing more than a religion, well, I, I can take it or leave it. I can do it. Or I, can, I, I can come. I can go. When it comes to that, then the devil definitely has influence on your agenda. And as far as I'm concerned, he's not worthy to have influence on my agenda. Only God can do that. I'm a servant of the Most High God, and I'm going to serve Him. Amen. So that's so. As soon as my problems become bigger, that's where it usually starts, and uh, uh, that's when the devil uh, has has a play. Now. I, I'm like anybody else. I look at things and different things like this, and this is what I come up with. It says we can uh, be encouraged every day by looking at what God is doing, or we can be discouraged every day by looking at what God is not doing. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. I said we can be encouraged every day by looking at what God is doing, or we can be discouraged every day by looking at what God is not doing. How many know the choice is ours this morning? I'm going to be reading the scripture. The scripture is what I'm going to be reading in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 is kind of an interesting chapter for me. I'm going to read and start in verse 28. But if you take the verses preceding what I'm about to read, to put it back in context what Jesus was talking about, how many remember the three cities that he, that he, he, passed, he called judgment on? Okay, the three cities. I, I like these three cities because when I went to Israel, every time I went to Israel, I had to check out these sites. They're right close together on the Sea of Galilee. There's, there's, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, there's uh, Capernaum, there is Chorazim, and there's Bethsaida. Uh, Bethsaida is kind of interesting archaeological site when I go to Israel because that's one of the newest ones that they really found. And it's an interesting thing because Bethsaida is where Peter was from. That was his hometown. It was a fishing village. But I was sta- as I'm standing in Bethsaida one time, and, and this has been proven. This is the archaeological site. This is where the city has been and so on and so forth. And, and uh, it's kind of interesting because when I stand there in Bethsaida and I look over the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is like a mile away, the edge of the waters of it. And so for years they didn't think this was Bethsaida. But then some brainiac got the, got the notion or the idea that around 400 A.D. That, that there was an earthquake that drained the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is actually lower than it was during Peter's time. And that used to be the shoreline. It was quite, it's quite interesting. Plus, the earthquake caused the continental shift to move the whole, whole ruins north. <laughs> Israel's an interesting place anyway. But Jesus comes up to these, to these three cities and he says, and he, and he, he kind of cursed them. He says, listen, he says, if the signs and wonders and the miracles, because that's where he did his most miracles, if signs and wonders and miracles had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, they have repented. He said, but your cities have not repented. He said, you, you have not repented one ounce. He said, all, all, most of Jesus' miracles were done there in that same area. He did more um, miracles in, in Capernaum than any place. And... Uh, so he, uh, uh, so he said, and uh, you go there now, these sites are desolate. There's nothing there, but they're just rocks and they're just uh, ruins. But Jesus said, he said, he said, in other words, when we, how we respond to the miracles of God makes a difference to the Lord. The response to the miracle is supposed to be repentance and that we're supposed to come back and seek him. And Jesus is angry. There is no doubt about it. You can li- read it for yourself in the preceding verses. But he says, no, he says, he says, uh, uh, he said, in the judgment day, it'll be worse for you three cities. He takes them as cities as a general. It'll be worse for you three cities than for Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he said. That's pretty bad. That's, that's a pretty harsh word. From that, he goes on in, in, in Matthew chapter 11 to where the verse I'm going to read in verse 28. Then he says this. <laughs> he says, come to me, all you that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus had something to say about the corporate city as a, as a whole, 
But then he begins to break it down to the individual and says, come on to me, all that needs rest. What I do, I call this verse the great exchange. Because what we have, we come to the Lord with what we have, and he exchanges, he takes away what we have and gives us what he has. Did I say that right? We come give him what we have, and he comes and gives us what he has. Are you here? Let me say that again. He's invited us to come into his presence to take what he has, but to give up what we have. And in that exchange, something supernatural happens. And then he says this. He says, says, take my yoke uh, 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 upon you and learn, uh, learn of me. And I am gentle, lowly in heart, and therefore I will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, how many know what a yoke is? Well, I'm talking about the the egg you fried for breakfast this morning. Not that kind of yoke. But this is a yoke that uh, actually... Uh, will harness two oxen together or whatever for doing a workload. So God is saying, or, or the, 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 Jesus is saying here, he said, all you that are heavy laden, in other words, you seem to be overworked. <laughs> are, do we have any of those in our society anymore? I mean, yeah, those that are overworked, come to me. In other words, those that are overburdened. You can be overburdened by worry, fear. You can be overburdened by labor, physical labor. Uh, you can be overwork, uh, overladen. If you, like I said before, if you look at the society today, you look at uh, uh, our, our surroundings, it can be an overload uh, of discouragement and so on and so forth as you look at what's going on. Are you here this morning? Praise the Lord. So uh, uh, it, the attacks on Israel and different things like that, we stand behind Israel, by the way. Uh, understand something, church, uh, uh, that that the, the spirit of anti-Semitism is not of God, it's of the devil. Are you here? And it has a kin to the Antichrist spirit mentioned into the Bible. In other words, if Jesus was alive today, anti-Semites wouldn't like him because he's Jewish. Hmm. Then it would be an Antichrist spirit, wouldn't it? Okay, well, praise the Lord. It's the devil all along. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, Jesus said in John chapter 10. But he said, I came to give you life and life more abundant. So the, basically what happens if we focus on the wrong things, then basically Satan has influence in our agenda. So Satan is trying to grab attention any place he can. He's got the attention of some preachers who were, oh, yeah, this is the last of the day, last days, and we need to prepare. Uh, the church is going to be out of here. How many know the church right now is, 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 is uh, being called by the Spirit of God to begin to assemble, to raise up an army? God left the church here for one reason, one reason only, to change this world that we live in. God is not afraid, and the devil can do whatever he wants to do in the earth. He is not going to change God's agenda one iota because God doesn't listen to him. God is, doesn't take his orders from the enemy, and neither should we. So Jesus is saying, okay, when the enemy comes in and you're overladen to this, he said, let's, let's do something. Let's make a shift or an adjustment in your life right now. In other words, come to me and I will give you rest. First thing he's going to do, he's going he's to, let's calm down. Everybody take a deep breath. Just calm down. Let's get into that rest. He says, then he says, he says, uh, uh, he says take my yoke upon me. When we're coupled with uh, with, with whoever we're pulling with is pulling this load. Jesus says, I have a yoke, but my yoke is easy. Hmm. My yoke is easy? Why? Because basically the power of God will outpower anything you can put forth. The power of God is greater than anything you can hand over. But the thing is here, we have to be hooked to him. Not just know about him, not just listen to the preaching of Jesus, not just listening to the words of Jesus, but we have to be yoked to him. That's different than just recognizing him. The devil recognizes Jesus. I had one guy tell me one time, he said, well, I believe in Jesus. I said, so does the devil. <laughs> Where's the difference here? You're going to have to separate the two. I said, so does the devil believe in him. The devil believes in him more than most Christians believe in him. Because he's, he's going to cross his power. But Jesus has shown us, and I shared this in other messages, Jesus has shown us that the devil has limited resources when it comes to strength. Jesus does not. 
Because Jesus is hooked into the source. We, we like to look at, at the devil like the devil is the evil portion of the Father in heaven. Not even close. They're not even in the same category. The devil's a fallen angel that was created by God. <laughs> how, how now can the creation be greater than the creator? Hmm. Maybe we ought to think about that next time we start making decisions away from God Amen. instead of towards God. Amen? Do we know more than the Creator knows? I don't think so. I don't think we'll ever get that smart. So I'm going to look at God as being the smartest one. So, no. But the fact is, is he has, Satan has an agenda, and he's trying to pull the church and pull God's people away from the agenda. He don't care about the world. He knows they're already lost. He doesn't care about that. He's out to kill, steal, and destroy. This is what Jesus said. His only motive, talking about that, is, is to kill, steal, and destroy. So why would I take and attention, get my focus on attention on what he is doing in the world over what God wants to do in the earth? So I want to take and shift my attention. Why do I want to do that? Because I said years ago, I'm going to hook, be yoked up to Jesus. I'm going to be hooked up to him. And to be hooked up to him, I can't have a devil agenda. That's what that mark is around your neck. Because when you're insisting on doing your way, you keep pulling against that yoke. And it makes a chafe mark. Did you notice that? No takers in this. Okay, <laughs> praise the Lord. Amen. He, Jesus is going to pull the, the, in the correct direction. Anything you want to do beside that, if you claim to be yoked to him, that yoke is going to be chafing. <laughs> Are you here this morning? Praise the Lord. I'm in a good mood. I really am. I'm just, I just I'm not meaning to preach hard. But how many know this for a fact? That there's three words in the Bible that describe the word of God, describe the Bible. And in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, 29, it says, it says, is not my word like a fire? There's one word. There's a description of God's word. It's not my word like a fire, uh, says the Lord. And like a hammer that breaks rock into pieces. So we have a fire, we have a hammer, and in Hebrews 4.12, it says it's a two-edged sword. I don't know about you, but I don't see a fluffy pillow in there any place. <laughs> I don't even see a, 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 a mattress, you know, what's that, memory foam mattress in there any place. The Word of God is not a cushy pillow or a... Why? Because God is trying to hammer, in a cha to hammer out change and bring the fire of the Holy Spirit within us and change our lives for the better. Because as human beings, we have a tendency to self-destruct with the devil's help, of course. But with, with God on our side, he wants to lift us up. So we have this place of exchange. Now, Jesus, you, you would think that out of all the people that walked the planet at the same time Jesus did, his disciples would be the smartest guys going. These guys will be on, on the cutting edge. But Jesus says in the book of John, he tells these guys, he says, uh, he, he says in John chapter 16, verse 12, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's got them there as a group, not individuals. Did you notice that Jesus did not do, very, uh, do a whole lot with individuals? Now, there was a group of three that he did most of his uh, ministry with and, and uh, miracles. But he talked to the group of 12. Do you notice that God wants to talk to groups, not just so much individual? It's not about individualism. It's about the group because what happens is where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. That's one. But where two or three come in agreement and praying, uh, touching anything, it'll be done for them. So God is looking for more than just an individuality. He's looking for groups to work together. Can I share with you the, your pastor this morning? I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this church working together to influence a lost city and lost souls, but to bring God's presence here. <clears throat> Are you here? But I got news for you. To do what God wants us to do here, we're going to have to talk to some Samaritans. Amen. All you religious minded. Matter of fact, we might have to have a, a, a round the well conversation. Amen. Are you up to that? Anyway, Jesus was talking, and he says this in, in, in John chapter 16. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. 
I'll say that again. You're looking at me like a dog with a new pan. Okay. John chapter 16, verse 12. Read it in your Bible. This is a New King James Bible I'm reading. It says, it says, I still have many things to say to you, but I cannot bear them. We're under the impression that because we have the Bible, because we have the Holy Spirit, that we know everything God knows now, and that we really don't need a whole lot of input, that we have everything we need to control our life. The devil is influencing your agenda. <laughs> if nothing else, on the pride, just on the pride alone. Praise the Lord. When we start telling God what he needs to do for us, we start becoming or try to become his Lord. I remember a situation in the Bible where Lucifer said, I will exalt my throne above that of your heavens. And he was thrown out like lightning. Jesus said, I saw him fall out of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty fast. And that was, insurrection was done with. So he came here or was exiled here to continue that in, insurrection. Jesus said, I have some things I want to share with you, but you're not able to bear them now. In other words, your capacity is too small and the weight of my words would crush you. That's what he's saying. John chapter 16, <laughs> verse 12, okay? He said, he said, and the word bear in the Greek means to carry or to take up. You're not going to be able to carry this. This is going to be too, too much for you. He says, right now. But he says in verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truths. My question is, when the spirit of truth comes, we don't have to be the Holy Spirit in God's presence, by the way, but when the Holy Spirit comes, Will we be smart enough to listen to them? Because God still has given us a free will. So he said, when the spirit of, of truth comes, you notice what he said? He says, he'll guide you. He will not reveal to you. He will guide you. And that word guide means to show the way, to teach, or to lead. So in other words, this truth that Jesus cannot begin to give us and we cannot bear, the truth that he's saying we can't bear, we have to be led into this truth. I don't know about you, but I see a growing process in here. I see a growing process because of diligence that God says. Now, who did Jesus say this to? His disciples. The guys who were the smartest ones on the planet when it came to, 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 to uh, uh, casting out devils. The smartest ones on the planet. They heard Jesus firsthand. They, they knew exactly what he would do next. They, they, they set up uh, uh, things for him. Uh, they, they were the closest. Everybody on the planet, they were the closest to the heart of God of any, any men in, in Israel, anybody, anywhere, any place. And Jesus said, even though you have done all this, and for three and a half years we've, we've followed it, even all of that, and the miracles you saw, the dead were raised, the blind eyes were opened, because Jesus has a redemptive solution for everything he steps into. I'll get to that in a minute. But he, he, says, he said, even though that, he said, the things I'm about to share, you can't carry it. I got words you can't even carry. You can't even begin to carry it. He said, I'm going to have to send my spirit here to lead you and to guide you. In other words, I can't even dump them on you. There are revelations, there are truths, there are things about me that you can't even be able to bear. You would just be overwhelmed right now if I was to give them to you. The weight would crush it. So what does he say? Because I believe that that is in, I believe that's a word for today also, that he wasn't just talking to the disciples. I believe there's a word in the word of God that would crush many people today. Now, I, I can't point people out. I'm not going to do that. We don't judge people. But the, the fact is, if that's the case, then how do we increase our capacity to receive what God wants us to receive? Because this has something to do with my success. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't share it. If this had not, well, if I can't carry it, oh, I guess I just won't worry about it. That's not what he says. What he's saying, he says, I'm going to give, there's a word that you can't carry, but you need to prepare for when the one who comes to lead you and guide you in all truths. Are you here? Praise the Lord. This is that pivotal point. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit has the ability 
to expand our capacity when we choose to submit ourselves to God's will and to submit to him. How many know that something about God that he doesn't give you knowledge to make you smarter? He just doesn't show you things in the word uh, so you could be puffed up and prophesy someplace. He doesn't give you a ministry so he, you can be exalted and look like the big shot on the block. That is not God. That's man. That's not God. Amen? No. How many know everything that God gives us is going to be bigger than what we think we can handle? Oh, I can think back 30 some odd years ago when God first called me into the ministry. I was happy because I heard the call. I was sad when I found out what the call was. <laughs> why? Because why was I sad? It wasn't sad for, for because God it was God. It was sad because I looked at myself in the present condition that I was in and say, how could this possibly be? Amen? How could this possibly be? If you look all through the Bible, you will find out that God used ordinary people. How could this possibly be? What God was looking for, he wasn't looking for me to figure something out. He was looking for my yes of submission. And my yes of submission brought me to the other things. Here's the thing we need to understand. If we serve God for so long or whatever we do, uh, we have that yes, and we move on that yes. Yes, I started a church. God wanted me to start a church in Key West. Yes, I did that. Uh, he wanted Lighthouse Christian Academy established. Yes, I did. I said yes to him. No matter what it costs, we just did it. And the cost seemed to be almost overwhelming and phenomenal, even to, even to this day, but we still do it. Amen. What happens is when we are used to giving his yes, we forget about the why. Why are we doing what he says? Can you think back of all the things you said yes to the Lord about? Now, can you say why? Because basically, we need to pick up where the why is and never lose that. I'm 72 years old. I don't see God slowing down in my life. So I, I, I told my wife, I says, you know what? To keep up with all these young people, what I've got to do and, and, and mentor and, and help people out, I said, I got to get in better physical condition. This was about, what, 10 years or so ago. I said, I got to get in better physical condition. I said, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I, 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 do, I do things like scuba dive and I, I, I work out and different things like this, uh, kind of slow down the aging process. I, I'm still a believer that, that, that uh, I, don't see, I don't see a retirement plan for preachers. I know preachers do and I have no, no freedom. I have no, no condemnation here. But for myself, I don't see a retirement plan in the future. Amen. I figure I'll get enough sleep when I'm dead or I'll be in heaven and, and, and continue on with my new life in heaven. But the fact is, is what I see, I see a planet that continually says no to God on everything God wants done. They look at the scriptures, they absolutely refuse. They look at the church, they absolutely refuse. And they do more refusal than they say yes. I said, Lord, how can we come together and by the power of the Holy Spirit begin to turn those no's into yeses? I need the Holy Spirit's guidance because that's one of the things that God was going to show that the disciples could not weigh in. Do you know why? Here's one of the reasons. The disciples were all Jewish. And now this Jewish mindset was going to have to change its whole entire mode of operandi to include all these Gentiles, including Samaritans. Remember who, what town, who it was that wanted to call fire from heaven to consume the Samaritans? Uh, that one Samaritan town, that was the Jewish disciples. Now all of a sudden Jesus says the ones that we want to destroy now become our friends. Hmm. That's just one of the things I could think of. I mean, there's several things that where, where God uh, wants to bring in. Uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't learn this from the Bible. You learned this from another source. But somebody told you that coming to church was your duty and obligation. If this is just your duty and obligation, then that's all you ever got from it. But when somebody told you that being part of a church, that God can show his purpose, he can show his love towards you, now we come together. It's not a duty. and It's a family. 
Now, maybe in some of your family organizations, you do feel it's a duty. <laughs> but the fact is, in the household of God, God brings us in because he wants to embrace us. He loves us so much. And I think we deserve for him to love him back sim similar to what he loves us. That's just my feelings about the whole matter. I can't begin to thank him for what he's done. Because without being in the ministry and giving, put me in a, a place that he's put me into, a very tough town, okay, I would, I, I don't know, I, I would be a different person because it was, I came to change Key West and Key West changed me. Uh, not Key West as a town, forget that. It's, it's just, it's still a debauchery. <laughs> no, the opportunity to minister for God changed my life more than just, than just sitting around. If I was to do what I wanted to do, I would not be the person I am today. Are you here? When Jesus says, come to me, all you that are heavy laden, let me give you an exchange. We automatically think duty, oh, this is going to be work, I'm not going to like this at all, and so on and so forth, even before we come. And this is the Jesus who we claim we love. <laughs> Amen? Some of the humble might say, well, I'm not qualified. He just qualified you with his word. Does his word not qualify you? Is there a higher word that qualifies you than the word of God? I don't think so. Amen? Obedience, you can put this in your notes, obedience increases our capacity. That's what we're talking about. And when he speaks, he creates. All God has to do is speak. When he spoke church in Key West for me to pastor, it was already in the works. As far as heaven was concerned, it was already going to happen. If I didn't take up the job, somebody else would have. But it was going to happen. Lighthouse Christian Academy, I used the ministry we started, when God spoke that, if I didn't start that, somebody else would. Now we're only one of three uh, in, the, in, in, in the city of Key West, one of three, uh, because every, all, the other churches have given up on that plan for whatever reason, various reasons, and I understand the reasons, but we ward for, through these things and keep things going on. Yeah. Amen? Are you here? You don't have to make room for your gift. God will make the room for it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's already established it. We get to walk in what he's established. Now, are we interested enough in Jesus to find out what he has for us? That's a question everybody has to answer individually. That's not a question for the preacher to use, uh, 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 you know, uh, making people feel bad. No, that's not what we're supposed to be for. We're supposed to just share the message of what Jesus does. You make your own decisions. Praise the Lord. But we're here to help. Amen? That's, that's what that means. Praise the Lord. Isn't it amazing? Uh, this thing always amazed me. It's Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. We have, a, we have the church of Ephesus. Go, I can talk to our church for just a minute. Uh, we have the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, as far as Paul was concerned, because he never, we cannot find a, a, a sentence of rebuke against that church, ever. It was seemed like to be the most perfect church. They had a revival going that was off the hook. It was really going on. He sent Timothy there to do two positions, one as a pastor, the other as an evangelist. And the church of Ephesus was going on. The town of Ephesus was a tourist town. It was a vacation spot. Sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> it was like Key West on steroids for the Roman Empire. And Romans would go there. There were houses of ill repute. There was all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of debauchery going on. And Paul establishes a church right there in the middle of all that. And it became one of the perfect, most perfect churches in Asia Minor. Uh, all the, uh, and, but it's mentioned as one of the seven. And Jesus mentions this in Revelation chapter 2. And he says all the things that they did that was good. And then he comes down to verse 4 and he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. Against it? What could you possibly find wrong? I mean, we would love to be a church like Ephesus. What could you possibly find wrong? He says, you left your first love. You left your first love. He said, remember therefore where you have fallen and repent. He was calling a perfect church to repent. Maybe because they got mechanical in what they were doing. 
Maybe because they couldn't let go of some things of success, they just kept carrying them into the next move and God wanted to do something different. Maybe it was like, I don't know, I wasn't there. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I'm older than that, not that old. Amen? But he says, repent and do the first works or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What happens when God moves, removes a lampstand? The only thing the church has to do without a lampstand is become a religious gathering. That's all it has. It has no revelation. It has no hope. It has no change in life for right here. We're all looking to die so we can go to heaven. That's all it's looking for. It's removed this lampstand. It removes the revelation of God and will not allow God to come in and speak any more revelation truth because this lampstand is gone. Its light is gone. Its light is snuffed out. He says, either you do this, repent, or I'm going to remove that ability that you have for the revelation that I'm giving you. Because it's not being, uh, maybe it's because it's not being used. And all they did is, well, we forgot our first love. What was your first love? Why? It was the why that you had to put with the yes. Yes, I'll serve God. Yes, I'll do what you say, Lord. Yes, I'll start your church in Key West. I was prophesied about me. Now I have to wake up in the morning and say, okay, uh, 30, almost 34 years later, why? Why? Amen? I can do this. I got eight minutes. I can do this. Praise the Lord. I sent my watch this time. Praise the Lord. Eight minutes. 38 seconds. 37, 36. Anyway, I, I can do this. Praise the Lord. I, I, I want to share something. It, it, it kind of goes along with Maybe this will help this morning. Is this okay? Yes. Okay. This, this is a message. I got a bunch of stuff running around my head in between the cobwebs. <laughs> I was studying for the message this morning, and the whole idea was I had, this, I had the exchange revelation back a week, a couple weeks ago. I just didn't, but I'm waiting for the time, and, and I heard from the Lord. In that study and preparation, and the things I do, I heard this phrase. I was looking at some things on YouTube and there, but I heard this phrase that said, ancient landmarks, ancient boundaries. And all of a sudden, it clicked. I know a scripture in Deuteronomy. I know a scripture here that talks about the, the ancient landmarks, the boundaries. Uh, it's called boundaries. Matter of fact, I'm going to use the king, uh, the the New American Standard Bible, because it uses the word boundary. So let's stay with boundaries, okay? I think it describes it the best. Uh, this is kind of a, a revelationary, uh, revelationary truth, but there's an understanding. Uh, how many know that, okay, well, let me share some scriptures with you real quick. Um, uh, so you just, you know, I'm on the same page, you're on the same page as me. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 28. I'm just going to list some scriptures. You can jot them down and look them up. Do not move the ancient boundaries which your fathers have set. Uh, Deuteronomy 19.14, it says, You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark which the ancestors have set in their inheritance which, uh, which you uh, will inherit in the land uh, that the Lord God gives you your possessions. If you go to the book of Joshua, you'll find out that Joshua uh, gave uh, allocations. We have a map back there with the different tribes of Israel uh, got the allocations of the land when it came in the promised land. Those are landmarks that cannot be removed, is what he's saying. Do not remove those landmarks. He goes, in, he goes on to say in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 17, it says, Cursed. Who oh, cursed is he who moves the neighbor, his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say amen. Micah 2, 5 says this, Therefore you will have no one to determine boundaries by lot. Now, lot is gambling. In other words, by lot in the assembly of the Lord. He's not speaking against gambling for say, but he's saying casting lots for land uses. In other words, that the ancestral plot cannot be put on the auction block because you need money. So the land is not yours to sell. The land is established by God because if you look in the book of Joshua, he established all those landmarks. You got this. I'm going to go to a spiritual meeting in a minute. Okay? But then I come across Paul. He says in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, he, he says, and he, uh, and he made blood of every nation and, uh, and men dwell on the face of the planet. 
And listen, he's talking about God, and they determined pre-appointed times and the boundaries for their dwellings. What happened, Paul was arguing with the Greeks in Athens, and he was getting nowhere. They had all this, all this knowledge, and basically what they did, they had a group of people, all they wanted to do was know things. They didn't want to do anything about it, they just wanted to know things. That's, I'm serious, they, they just wanted, they just uh, uh, absorbed knowledge. So Paul's trying to tell him, and he, said, and, and he comes up to this place, and here is the, uh, uh, the he says, this, ta- this town and this country is full of idolatry. He says, you even have a God called the unknown God, that you have an altar for the unknown, or a monument for the unknown God, just in case we miss one. <laughs> I'm serious. You go back and read it. And, and, and so he said, this is how it is. He said, now let me tell you about the one true God. And in that t- telling about that, he said, he's the one that sets the boundaries. You have a dwelling today because he put you here. You have this today because he's established you here. He set the boundaries. Now, with that said, I said all that. Uh, this probably will be a whole other teaching about on itself, but all right, just indulge me for a minute. But, he, he, but the, the, so we have these boundaries. When Jesus comes into a situation, I don't care if it's blind eyes that need to be healed or whatever the healing situation is, poor people need to have uh, uh, wealth. He got his tax money one time out of the mouth of a fish. Okay, when Jesus comes into a situation, regardless of what that situation is, he brings a redemptive solution. I believe one of the things, one of the things that he was talking to his disciples about, that when they came in, uh, that, that, they, that the crushing words that he could not give him is that they now would produce the redemptive solution in everything they went. So what Jesus did, just kind of abstract in a minute. I mean, just, just listen to the symbolism. Jesus set boundaries for which they should go. And the boundaries were bigger than what they can imagine. In other words, he says, you go lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. recover. What's the boundaries? All sick people are, are in the boundary. Whether we believe it or not. Okay, that's the boundaries that Jesus set. Here's a boundary. Okay, Kevin Kerr, you come to Key West uh, uh, 34 years ago. You come to Key West and you go ahead and establish this church. But my church isn't as big as a lot of the church. My church is small a lot of churches. Oh, are you looking at your neighbor's boundaries? I just hit on something that was a real problem in this town when I first came here. I don't know if it still is. I don't know. Pastors would get jealous even boards would get their pastors together, the, the ones that were hirelings, and they could be fired if their attendance, church attendance went down. Now, I understand something here. As far as I'm concerned, there ain't nothing here to get jealous over. <laughs> it really isn't. Matter of fact, one guy was in a pastor's meeting one time, and he asked me, he says, he says uh, uh, do you know so-and-so, uh, uh, these people? I says, I've heard of them. Uh, he said, well, have you seen them pop up in your church? I said, why? You got a couple of sheep jumped the fence? He said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did, and I'm trying to find out where they went. I said, really? I said, do you need more sheep? Oh, yeah, I'll carry all the sheep I can get. I said, I got a couple I'll send you. No, he said, you never send me anybody any good. <laughs> this is a conversation with two pastors, really? I'm laughing, I'm joking, because I'm laughing with the guy. And I said, man, he's serious. I said, this is, this is something else. We're going to be jealous of somebody else's boundaries? Uh-uh. Understand something about this church, big, small, or indifferent. This church is placed here by God. Its longevity is because God said so, not because a man has desired it. That's for sure. Okay? And because he he has set the boundaries, I'm satisfied with the boundaries. He can expand them if he wants to. He can shrink them down. There's one time he said, your boundaries right now in this season, he says, you're going to go around the world and preach the gospel. And I did. Amen. From here to West Africa, to South America, Central America, back again. But came back here. This was always home. Yeah. God expanded the boundaries. Why? He was trying to train me to understand that his word is paramount. It's not what we think church is supposed to be. It's what he says it's supposed to be. Amen. He sets the boundaries. Our boundaries have been sh- shifted back to where now we follow Christ. Well, Jesus, I'm not very good at laying hands on people. He doesn't care. That's right. You can stink at it. 
But you can't move the boundaries. Here's the sad part. Church, listen to me real good at this last point I'm going to make. Here's the sad part. Are we using our entire boundary? I, I got thinking about a field uh, in, in Bible times, and a rich man would take and he would plant a field, and he would, he would harvest that harvest, and he was commanded by the law to round the corners. Amen? It was called the glean. It was, and he was commanded to round the corners. What was that for? That was for anybody who didn't have their own field to go ahead and, 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 and cash that wheat, and they could have that. That was, that was free. So he says, no, you supply for people who can't supply for themselves. And that's what, so you were rounding the corners. You see the, the Orthodox Jews with the, well, that's the, they're not supposed to cut the corners. <laughs> you're looking at me you're like <laughs> amen so this is how serious it was my question is this is the church today plowing its full borders and boundaries hey leave the corners I don't care the glean is a matter of fact uh, that's how Boaz met uh, Ruth and Ruth met Boaz Ruth came up and she needed, she needed some, some, some glean she needed some uh, uh, fields and Boaz says don't worry about it, honey. You just sit right here. I'm paraphrasing, of course. You sit right here. You, 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 you. Go get the glean for her and bring it to her. <laughs> That's not how it's supposed to work. She's supposed to be able to go get it herself, you know. But Boaz, no, he should have found favor. Now bring her the glean right over here. Oh, we'll get, we'll get more than glean for you. We'll give you everything, give you anything you want. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. So Boaz just fell head over head, heels in love. But my question is, if God has set the boundaries where we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, if he set the boundaries that we sow and reap we bring the sacrifice of God into the house of the Lord, do we desire that? Is our, is our desires allowing us to fill the boundaries? I didn't say move them. Only one can move them is God. Jesus spoke those boundaries, those are everlasting boundaries. I don't care what you believe, I don't care what I believe, those boundaries will not be moved. Anybody that tries to move the boundaries, as it says in the, in the law, will be cursed. See, the devil's trying to get you to think small. God's trying to get you to think bigger. Which one's going to win? Well, I'm my own person. You have never been your own person, ever. There's either been one influence or another. It's either God or the devil. You make the determination. But you're sitting here listening to truth this morning so you can make a determination. You, you can have an a, a informative in, a, a, a decision-making thing. Amen? That's it. How many got something out of the message this morning? I got more, but I got to stop. My watch just budged. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I, I put this together this morning, and I didn't know. I had, I had more notes than that. I just saw all stuff to put together. I said, Lord, I said, put this together into a message. Uh, um, this is like the second week this has happened. And I, 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 I'm doing this for a reason. I believe God is saying something to this church. It's time to move on. Uh, not move on, move out of the neighborhood. I'm not talking about that. It's time to get rid of some of these old religious ideas, please. I don't care if you're brought up in religion. Leave it in your past. Let's listen to the spirit of God and what he wants to do now. There are people that are going to hell. There are people that are su suffering right? that we know every day. Did you go on your jobs you know people? Okay, be that light. I didn't, oh, I didn't get to Isaiah chapter 60. Oh, God, you need to read that. Oh, man. I'm going to do it. Is it okay? Just one more, one more scripture. I got to. Now that I mentioned it, I just can't leave it alone. Isaiah chapter, I'll go real fast. You got to listen fast. I talk fast, so listen fast. It's Isaiah 60, verse 1. He says, Rise, shine, for your light has come. Everybody knows this one. And the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you in his glory, will appear upon you. Listen to this. Nations will come to your light. I'm reading out of the, the New American Standard Version. 
Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes around about. They shall all gather together. They shall come to you. Your sons and uh, your sons will come afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Amen. What did he just say? Real quick, I got I to gotta go. But he's saying, here you stand with this light. Arise, shine. We're just shining. And if not, I can just polish the top of my head. I really shine. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're just shining. Then what God says, let the glory of the Lord come upon you. So as we're shining as individuals, now God's in a position where he's places. God's glory comes upon us. Now we're so bright that the nations can see us. Amen. And are drawn to the light in which they see. In other words, they like what they see. Because God adds to us. So we're standing here. He comes on us, adds to us. Man, I tell you what, we are the brightest people on the planet. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's what we're supposed to do. That's our position here in Key West. Just shine. If you don't know what to say, if you don't know what to do, just shine. But shine. Shine isn't grumbling and complaining. and It's not shining. It's dull. Shine is to be happy. Enjoy what God has given us. Enjoy his blessings, but don't forget where they came from. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, that's it. <laughs> Let's stand our feet. <laughs> I got more, but I got to stop. Or we'll be here next Tuesday. I'm here in this hour. The spirit of the Lord is just pouring out and pouring out. So you got kind of a prophetic message this morning, <clears throat> but... Uh, I, I, I'm praying and hoping that everybody in an individual setting can grab, grab something out of this word this morning that they can use starting next week. Amen. Up for time of bio. <laughs> but begin to use it. Work, work in this change. I dare say if I went around this room, there's not one person in this room that's 100% happy with their life right now. I'm not guaranteeing any, anything here, but what I'm saying, I'm saying is let's examine why and let's examine the areas where they're not and see what, what the devil has influenced and what God needs to influence. Because as we're standing here, we've got to rise and shine. Okay, Lord, I don't know what that means, but I'm rising and I'm shining. So I look towards you. That's the start. As soon as you say that and do that, now he adds his light. His light also comes as revelation. I didn't get into the hope and the Holy Spirit. I'll get into that next week. But the fact is, is, is our hope resides in the Spirit of God. No Spirit, no Holy Spirit, no hope. Uh, I'll share some testimony. I, that, that's, that, that goes back quite a few years for me, but I'll share that when that is. But this is what we're talking about. So I didn't get into that section this morning. And I didn't expect to do the ancient boundaries. But I'm telling you right now, God has set his boundaries. One thing I didn't say is that when the children of Israel came into the promised land, they stepped on some boundaries, and God's told them to do it. The boundaries of their enemy, Amen. they were allowed to walk on, <laughs> even move, <laughs> cause wars. God says, no, this promise is for, from Abraham, covenant. You've got to understand covenant to understand it. This is your land. Kick out the illegal boundaries. Maybe some of you need to do that at home. Let's get rid of the boundaries that Satan has set up. Amen. And start letting God's boundaries be, be present there and established. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I really do. Have to, we thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you, Father God, for the presence of God in here. Humble, we're, we're so humbled by your presence and by the revelation. I pray I preached something that didn't crush anybody this morning. But, Lord, that we can all look at this thing because there's not one person in here that this word would escape. Father, this word is set forth for your church in this day and this hour. I believe it. I believe it's not just for this church, but it's the message that you're putting across in our nation, across nations, and your churches, Father God, that are hungry to do the will of God in these last days, as they say. But, Lord, really, last day or not, we're looking towards you because it's going to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Amen. We give you praise in the name of Jesus, which get led up to another thought. I got to stop. I got to shut up. I mean, this is, amen.